Well, good morning, church. It's a good day to be in the house, Lord. Amen? Well, we're in week six of our sermon series through the book of Acts, and we're calling this series The Power of His Presence. And the book of Acts is basically an account of how things moved forward in the absence of the physical presence of Jesus. And so it really is a history of the Christ-following church. And as we take this journey through Acts, we are framing our discussions in such a way that acknowledges that every single one of us has a difference to make. What we choose to do really does have an impact, whether we choose to show up or to not show up, whether we choose to give or not to give, we choose to participate or not to participate, we choose to add value to or not add value to, if we choose to do what everyone else does or if we choose to live by a higher standard. Our choices have an impact. We see the truth of this throughout the book of Acts. As we walk through this book, we see God transforming people's lives in a very real and powerful way, and we see the power of his presence and how we can choose to be intentional about the impact our lives have on those around us. And so today, we're in Acts chapter 6, and we're going to cover a lot of ground in the scripture this morning. And so if you have your Bible, you might want to follow along. Um, we're going to be leaning kind of heavily on the text today. The, the verses will also be on the screen. We're going to jump in to uh, Acts chapter 6, starting with verse 1. Scripture says this. In those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. Okay, so we're going to pause right there. Let me tell you this. The, the church is starting to become more organized entity at this point. They started out just preaching the gospel, sharing the good news of Jesus, what he did, how much he loves us, who he is. And God has come on the scene many times doing some pretty cool stuff. And the people are getting healed. They're being set free from bondage. People are being serious about lining their lives up with God's word and walking in his ways. And more and more people are coming into the fellowship of believers every day. And so uh, as the church is growing, they, they see more and more needs being brought to the fellowship. And so suddenly, there's this need for resources. So the people start uh, bringing what's necessary to meet those needs. They're taking care of each other. They're making sure that everyone has enough, that uh, no one goes hungry, that no one has to go through life alone. People are giving away stuff that they don't need, and they're even selling possessions and land to be able to bring the money from those sales to the church to help meet the needs of the people and to pave the way for the, ch for the future. See, so the church is growing, and the number of disciples is increasing. And, and up to this time, we've talked about uh, the apostles, those who lived and walked with Jesus in the flesh. Uh, and we've talked about them as the disciples. We tend to use the word apostle and disciple throughout the Gospels, uh, mostly interchangeably in reference to these 12 disciples. But in Matthew chapter 28, Jesus tells them to go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. And so this is what they're doing they're making disciples, and so now, in this side uh, of Acts, when we talk about the disciples, we're talking about a larger group of men and women who are committed to and full-on following after God with all that they have and all that they are. Now, they're not just churchgoers, but they are committed, transforming, revolutionary remnant kind of group. And so that leads me to the first lesson that I see here in this passage, and that lesson is this, multiplication is important. Go and make disciples. See, Jesus wasn't uh, concerned as much on reaching the world as he was in making disciples who would make other disciples, who would make other disciples. And this process of multiplication would reach into all the world, generation after generation, till the end of time, with the healing, saving, redeeming message of the cross of Jesus, who is the Christ. He started with 12 guys, and 2,000 years later, it continues to endure. You see, multiplication is essential. Think about this for a second. If you are the only person who can do what you can do, then what you do will not endure. It will come, and then it will pass. But if you will teach and train up someone else to do what you can do, then they can do that thing and they can train up someone else to do it and so on and so on and so on. And then what you do will endure, yes? You see, multiplication is more important than preservation. 
I'm going to say it again. Multiplication is more important than preservation. And that's what we're seeing here. The church is growing. People are starting to have a difference of opinion about how things are being run. Fortunately, we don't have any of that in the church today. <laughs> Truth is, we're all humans, and we still do uh, deal with these same issues that they dealt with in the first century church. So, but the church administration, they're trying. They're trying to figure out how do we tweak the system so that we can become more effective. And so the 12, that's the core of the movement, these 12 apostles. And if we took that and looked at today's system, it would be like, it would be like a mega church that had a staff of 12 pastors. That would be the church administration. Or if we bring it down to our world in a church this size, it would be the pastor and a few key leaders. That's the core of the administration. And so now it appears here in the book of Acts that the, that the pastor or the team of pastors are responsible for doing everything. They're making the flyers. They're cleaning the church. They're stocking the fridge. They're paying the bills and teaching Sunday school and preaching and managing the webpage and looking for new real estate. And, and they're in charge of the distribution of donations. Pretty much anything that needed to be done in the life of the church is what they're doing. And they're trying to figure out how do we keep doing the essentials without letting too many things fall through the cracks. And so here's what they decide in verse 2. So the 12 gathered all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So here's the lesson that I see here. You need to know what you are called to do, and you need to operate in your strengths. See, these guys are like, hey, you know, God really called us to preach, to share the good news of Jesus, to help people live lives of transformation, but suddenly we're bogged down by these administrative duties and details, and so we're thinking that we need to find some other people to take over some of these things because they are important. They are just as important as preaching. And we need people who can pay more attention to these details so that we can uh, be more committed to our strengths and our calling. And fortunately, they didn't have to worry about, well, let's check and see if there's money in the budget to hire a church secretary because the pastor's getting burned out by all these administrative details. They didn't have to deal with that. They were able to quickly appoint people to take care of the different aspects of ministry so that those duties were taken care of and those, uh, and those who were called to specific ministries could operate in their strengths. And so here's an important lesson for us as we seek to walk in obedience and to be intentional about making a difference in the kingdom. As with many things in life, making a difference requires resources. And to some level, it requires administration. And you will be inundated with lots of duties that need to be attended to, and you will soon realize that they will drag you away from your strengths and your calling. So whenever possible, delegate those things to others who are committed and qualified. So you can only, uh, you can't do everything, you can only do a few things. And the more you have to do everything, the more quickly you will burn out and the more things will fall through the cracks. And so as you begin to delegate responsibilities, keep in mind what they did here in Acts chapter 6. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. When you're delegating or when you're appointing people to specific tasks, look for people who are spiritually grounded and growing in their faith and seeking after wisdom because uh, these are the people who will make up the best core team. Find people who are passionate about the things of God and understand and are able to keep the main thing the main thing. Here's another lesson that I see. Uh, what are they appointing people to, by the way? to wait tables. See, it says it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait tables. So here's the lesson, and this is a very important one. There are no small, unimportant jobs in the kingdom. Scripture says, whatever you do, in word or in deed, work at it with all your heart because it is the Lord God you are serving. There are no small, unimportant jobs in the kingdom. What you do has an impact. It matters. 
Whatever you do from filling up the salt shakers to shoveling the snow to running copies to making coffee to working in the nursery or cleaning toilets or pulling weeds or preaching the good news, nothing is insignificant. It all has a place and it all serves a purpose. And what you do makes an impact. Come on now. We're going to switch gears here. The next passage of scripture is a story of one of those seven chosen men, a man named Stephen. Let's look at verse 8. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. Opposition arose, however, from the members of the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Cilicia and Asia, who began to argue with Stephen. But they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave him as he spoke. Then they secretly persuaded some men to say, we've heard Stephen speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. So they stirred up people and the elders and the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. They produced false witnesses who testified, this fellow never stops speaking against the holy place and against the law. But we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down to us. All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen, and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Let me pause right there to say this. As you set out to do something for the kingdom of God, you better get ready for people to attack you, to tell lies about you, and to try to turn other people against you. <laughs> it just goes with the territory. We see it throughout scripture. And when that happens, you need to have grace under fire. You need to keep your cool. You need to seek after wisdom. And you need to let God be the one to fight this battle for you, just as we see uh, that Stephen's going to do. Stephen's questioned about these false charges against him. And what is his answer? His answer is pretty much uh, the rest of chapter 7. I'm going to summarize that for you rather than read it for you. But uh, here's what's happening. Stephen full of the Holy Spirit, and with his face looking like the face of an angel. He tells people about their country's great history and their sad disobedience to God and how Jesus came to change it all. He talks them through what God has done since Abraham and how the people have responded to God and how they've responded to his, his laborers. And the lesson that I see here is this for us. Do not ever forget your spiritual heritage. See, it's part of keeping the main thing the main thing. Don't forget what you were born out of, and don't forget the God who is strong and has shown himself faithful time and time again. Don't forget the fathers and mothers of our faith. Don't forget those who have prayed for you and spoken over you the love and the faith and the ways of God. Don't forget the spirit of the living God, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead that lives and moves in you. Don't forget his power and his love and his mercy. Do not ever forget your spiritual heritage and the strong shoulders on which you stand of those who have gone before you and paved the road ahead of you. And do not ever forget the part that you have to play in the spiritual heritage of future generations. Be faithful to do your part to further the cause of Christ, to live lives that are covered with the fingerprints of God, to be faithful to pray for others, to teach and lead others in the ways of God that you too may become strong shoulders of faith on which the future generations may stand. Come on now. So Stephen's talking to them about this message, and as he's talking of this message of redemption that comes through Jesus, he's also telling them uh, about their own sins and evils. The religious people didn't like it at all, and so here's what they did next, verse 54. When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious, and they gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the God of glory and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And at this, they covered their ears, yelling at the top of their voices. They all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. 
Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he said this, he fell asleep, and Saul approved of their killing him. So this is the first uh, kind of introduction that we have to Saul, and we're going uh, to learn a lot more about Saul in the weeks to come. Well, here's what I see uh, the message, the lesson for us in this, and, and we'll close this out in our message today. And what I see in Stephen is that things don't always work out the way you think they will. <laughs> right? we, have a, we have a tendency to build things up in our human minds, and, and so often the reality is nothing like we imagined that it would be. And the reality is that stepping out on a big thing, making a difference in the kingdom, just might get you killed one day but you know what there is a 100 percent chance that you are going to die one day anyhow so why not strive with every breath you have to preach and live in and walk out and work for the kingdom of the living god that all may know his goodness and his grace. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you, and we praise you for this day, for the opportunity that we have to come into um, this fellowship of believers, for the opportunity that we have in this nation to worship you freely, without reservation, Lord, that we, we have the freedom to assemble, we have the freedom uh, to worship our God to sing praise, to lift up our voices, to lift up our hands, to, to live our lives in praise to you. God, we do acknowledge that not every person on the face of this earth has that freedom, and we are grateful that we have it. And God, at the same time, we'd have to admit so often we take it for granted. God, I pray that you would help each and every one of us to, to, uh, to, to consider more the importance of the choices that we make, to consider more the importance of the impact that we have around us and to consider more the necessity of following after you with all that we are and all that we have. Lord, we need to see revival in our land and we know that that comes from you and God, we know that it begins with us. May revival begin with me. May each of us say, God, help me to examine my heart. Send your spirit to, to help uh, uh, show me, to reveal to me, to bring conviction, to bring encouragement, to bring peace. Help me to follow hard after you and help me to live my life in such a way that I help point people to Jesus. God, we thank you and we praise you for everything that you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen? Amen. I don't know.